Again, we say good morning. We're thankful that each one of you are here, and we pray that you've all received a blessing from the music as we, uh, as we worship the Lord through song, and it is about worshiping Him. And we're here to glorify and honor Him in everything that we do. I do want to remind you before we uh, get into the message, you can go ahead and be turning to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 16. But I want to remind you, and we've, uh, it's posted on the web, uh, website and uh, on uh, Facebook, but as we've said, we live in a day of Instagram and Facebook capturing our moments, the moments and pictures of our lives. But beginning on next Sunday morning, we're going to gather together, we're going to get out the album, and we're going to examine pictures uh, of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. As we examine some scriptures from John's gospel, we're going to look at different pictures in his life and his ministry and see how Jesus affects our life and what he should mean to us as we worship him. So I pray that you'll be here for every uh, message in that series as we look at each Sunday, uh, a different aspect. There's about 21 chapters, uh, probably be looking at maybe 23 messages because some of the chapters have two or three good pictures uh, and, and things of Jesus that we want to look at, but uh, it will go on and, and it'll probably go up to March or, or April, uh, but uh, it'll be about Jesus as we focus upon Him. And this morning we want to preach a message from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 14 through 16 with the thought, our greatest opportunity. Our greatest opportunity. You, you might wonder what that is as we come, begin a new year and we want to share you from Paul's writings here what our greatest opportunity is. So let's begin here in verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. May we have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart that's receptive to his word this morning. This morning, we stand uh, on the threshold of a new year. We've already uh, celebrated New Year's Eve, and the new year's already started. Uh, but as a church year, this is the first Sunday that we've been able to gather together, and we stand on that threshold of that new year. And it's a time that we reflect on the past year, but it's also a time that we prepare for the upcoming year. We need to keep in, thought, in our minds what Paul said in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, when he said, But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. At this time of year, many of us will make resolutions that will go in one year and out the other. We determine that we're going to do something or we're not going to do something. And, and when, we, when we look back at the end of the year, we see that we have failed to keep those resolutions. And that does not mean that you should not make resolutions, that you should not plan and, and try to say that you want to do some things. Uh, you know, just because you failed in the past doesn't mean you can't resolve again because, you see, God is the God of second chances. God is the God of new beginnings. He's the, the God, if you're a golfer, of mulligans. He's, he's the God of the do-overs. He allows us to start out fresh every year. He's the God of a new start and a second chance. He's, you see, when we started this year, we start out with 365 days, a blank page. Each day is blank. And we start out with 365 new chances to get things right that maybe we didn't in the past. We're now in the season of watching bowl games. And we know that uh, tomorrow night is the, the big final game. But one of the most memorable bowl games took place some years ago at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. The University of California was playing Georgia Tech. And late in the second quarter, Tech had the ball on the 33-yard line moving toward uh, the their end zone. And, and when a man named Thomason was hit, he was carrying the ball, he was hit, and he fumbled the ball. And the center for the University of California scooped up the ball, spun around, and began to run with the ball, and the crowd began to go wild. They began to cheer. He took that fumble. He headed toward a goal. His eyes were watching the goal, and he's running ahead of everyone else, but with one problem. He's headed toward the wrong end zone. He had gotten confused and got spun around, and he was headed for the wrong goal and was going to score for the opposing team. His own teammates were trying to yell at him and tackle him. And for, after he ran for 67 yards in the wrong way, Roy Riggles is tackled by Benny Lom, one of his own teammates. He's tackled on the one-yard line. One can only imagine his embarrassment, his shame, his humiliation as he, as he walks back to the bench. 
Some are laughing and the jeers and the catcalls and the hooting was all for Roy Riggles. They went into the halftime and the coach put his arm on the shoulder of Roy Riggles and he spoke to him words of admonition and encouragement. And he talked to the team and before the team went on the field, Coach Price looked at the team and he said, all of the men that played in the first half are going to play in the second half. The players got up, they started out for the field, all except Roy Riggles. Coach said, Roy, didn't you hear me? Roy looked up. His cheeks were wet with tears. Coach, he said, I can't do it. I'm embarrassed. I can't do it for the life of my, to save my life. I've ruined you. I've ruined the team. I've ruined myself. I couldn't face that crowd in the stadium to save my life. Coach Price went over, reached out and put his arm around him. He said, Roy, I said you were going to play. Get up and go out back into the game because the game is only half over. You see, we have a future ahead of us. The men said that after he came out and played in the second half, he played so brilliantly that they had never seen a man so, you know, play so great in a game in the second half. Roy Riggles played that second half because he realized from his coach's words that it was only half over. And I tell you that story because many of us this past year, many of us had had similar situations in our life and in this past year. We failed miserably. We headed in the wrong direction. We had the wrong focus. We didn't achieve the goals that we had set. You see, I want us to find God's goal for our life and for this church. I want us to live life to its fullest this year. I want us to be all that we can be going into this year. Not only personally, but collectively. As a church body. I want you to see something up on the screen. It's some numbers. Three different numbers that we want to put up on the screen. You see those three numbers. What are those three numbers? What do you think those three numbers are? 31,536,000, uh, 8,760. It is the number of seconds on the top that we have in a year. The number of minutes, 525,600. And the number of hours that each of us are given at the start of every new year. We are given these numbers. We have 365 days. We have 52 weeks. We have 12 months. We have a great opportunity. And the message entitled, Our Greatest Opportunity, Our Greatest Opportunity is Time. T-I-M-E. Now in the Bible, there are two words that are translated for time. One word is chronos. And we understand that word. It's from where we get the word chronology. It simply means the passing of time, like the many hours in a, a day or so many minutes, so many seconds. You know, some people call their watch a, a, a chronometer. And, and it's keeping up with the time, keeps count of it as the seconds pass and the segments pass. It's called chronos. But there's a second word, and this is the word that is used here in verse 16, and that is karyos. It literally means opportunity. We have before us a great opportunity. That same word is used in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. And it says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. We have the opportunity before us because the word in Galatians and here in Ephesians are the same word. So what Paul is saying in both places is that we need to redeem the opportunity of days, hours, minutes, and seconds that we have been given. We need to see time not just something that is passing, but it's something that is an incredible opportunity that we have to glorify God. When we redeem time, what we're really redeeming is an opportunity that has been given to us. And why are we to redeem that opportunity? Because Paul tells us because the days are evil. We live in evil days. We live in days that would try to take away our energy and our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to take that opportunity and use it wisely. You know, this, this past year, some of you, some of us, maybe went in the wrong direction. Maybe we had the wrong focus. Maybe some people sat on the sidelines. And I pray this will not be the year that we sit in the sidelines and sit, sit in the pews, that we will get it in the game, we will get on board in serving the Lord afresh and anew. We will have the right focus and the right direction. You know, this year we need to maximize our opportunities for God's glory. I want us to examine some truths this morning. 
as we look at our greatest opportunity and we talk about time and that opportunity given to us. First of all, if you have your bulletin and the outline is there on the back, the first point is the provided opportunity of time. In verse 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. This verse is talking about waking up and starting the day. Starting out your day in the morning. Starting out the new year. God's Word is saying there is an opportunity before us. Don't let it pass away. We need to be awakened spiritually, not just physically, but spiritually as the days are evil. And they have caused us to become complacent and sleepy. For most of us this morning, the alarm clock or the radio woke us up. I have a daughter that's still not got used to one alarm clock going off. She sets her phone with about five or six different alarms. And you'll hear it going off in there and she doesn't get up. You'll hear it going off in there. And you don't know how she's ever going to figure this out. But hopefully this morning you woke up that way. Maybe you weren't like the, uh, the mother had a, a, a child that she was just getting frustrated. And she would go in and tell him it was time to go to school. And he would just roll back over and sleep. She did everything. She turned the music up loud. She turned the lights on. She tried everything in the world. And so finally she got so frustrated. She went in there and filled a, a pitcher up with ice, ice water, cold ice water. And went in there and poured it right on him. And he popped right out of bed that morning. And so hopefully nobody had to do that to you. But I hope that you got up going to church and you're not like the, uh, the, the, the one that was asleep. The mother went to wake up her son for church one Sunday morning and she knocked on the door and he said, I'm not going. Maybe you've had that experience with your ch children or somebody. And he says, well, why not? He said, I'll give you two reasons. One is they don't like me and two, I don't like them. His mother replied, I'll give you two reasons that you will go to church today. One is you're 47 years old, and the second one is you're the pastor. <laughs> so we need to waken up spiritually. <laughs> and no, I know that you like me, and I love you all too, so I, I, I didn't dread coming to church this morning. But anyway, we need to wake up spiritually. And, and Paul is telling us we need to wake up. God wants us to wake up to His Word and to wake up to His messenger. The messenger and His Word are, are things that wake us up when we come to hear from God. God has provided you and me that opportunity. The Creator of all time has given us two great gifts. One is Jesus Christ. We've come through the Christmas season. We preached about that. We have the gift of Christ that's been given to us. And we have that opportunity to be saved. That He came and died for our sins. And He rose from the dead. And we can put our faith and trust in Him. But another gift that He has given us is time. Yes, we have that opportunity to be saved. To have a relationship with Him. But then He gives us the time to work. To, to serve. To, to love. To laugh. To labor. To, to, to play and have recreation. He gives us this time to enjoy life. And to enjoy life to its fullest. But like any gift, how you use it is really up to you. The gift of salvation is up to you. Will you receive it? The gift of time is up to you. Will you do something with it? Don't take time for granted. We need to see every day as a gift from God. I want you to think about it. In order for you to cease living, God would have to take your life. All God would have to do is to take your breath away. I've been in the hospital and seen people take their last breath. God has removed that breath for them and they cease living. So every day is a gift from God. And we need to appropriate that gift and use it wisely. Time is something that God gave you today and God may give you tomorrow. It's not something that you own. God is both the creator and the possessor of time. You and I are to be good stewards of the time that He has given to us. One day, I will have to give an account for how I use this day, for how I preach this message, for what I did and how I ministered to God. You see, every second, every minute, every day, every year is a precious gift from God, and we must give an account to Him for that. An unknown author penned these words, I have only just one minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me. I can't refuse it. I didn't seek it. I didn't choose it. But it's up to me just how I will use it. I must, I must suffer if I lose it, give an account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Think of how a life can change in just a minute. Think of what can happen in just a minute. 
We don't need to go around saying, well, that person has more time than I have. I just don't have time because that is incorrect. We are all given the same amount of time, 24 hours a day. Everybody has 24 hours in their day. The difference between people is not that some people have more time or others have less. It is that how you use that time. I was talking to someone yesterday about being a pastor and a bivocational pastor. I had a funeral. I was talking to someone afterwards and we were talking about being a bivocational pastor. And they said, how do you have time to do all that? And I said, I've been really blessed because before I even became a pastor, I, I, I'm an accountant by nature and went to school for that. But God has, has blessed me to be a good organizer of my time. To organize time and, and to know how to get the most out of my time and still be able to do all the things that need to do in, in your day or in your week. And so we have to organize our time. But God has given us all the same amount of time. So we see, first of all, the provided opportunity of time in verse 14. But secondly, I want you to notice the present opportunity of time in verse 15. We see the present opportunity. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And he goes on to say uh, in verse 16, redeem the time. Time is a provided opportunity, but time is something that has been given to us by God, and we need to awaken to the opportunity. But we also know that it's a present opportunity that is before us every morning when we start out. Notice the tense in these verses of Scripture. Redeem the time now. He doesn't say anything about the past, or he doesn't say anything about the future. Redeem the time now because it's present tense. The Bible says, this is the day which the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. We will uh, have opportunities during this day to rejoice in Him, to praise Him, to serve Him. You see, we can do nothing about yesterday. We can do nothing about tomorrow. There are only two days, uh, there's only one day that we really have and that's today. There are two days that can steal the joy from today. There are two days that can steal the productivity from today. And that is yesterday and tomorrow. You know, there are a lot of people who live in yesterday. Past mistakes, past guilts, all these things they think about. Oh, what ifs? I could have done this. I should have done this. And, and, and they're worried about yesterday. And then some people will look and live into the future. Tomorrow. What am I going to do tomorrow? And look anticipating but the Bible warns us, as we read this scripture before, Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14, Paul said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. That is, I don't think I've arrived. I don't think I'm already perfect. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul had to learn some things. And item A under our outline is Paul had to forget the past. Paul had to forget the past. First, he had to forget past guilt. How many of us have guilt in our life? Every hand would go up. There's all of us have done things in our past. And we feel ashamed. We feel guilt. We know that they're wrong. And, and God has forgiven us for those. We praise God for that. But sometimes others in the church, and we don't need to be this way, but they hold that against them. They, they say things about them. They talk about them. And they bring it up from time to time. And, and then we begin to worry about those things. Well, what's people going to say? What's people think? And, and, you know, they know I've done this, and, and God knows I've done this. And we live in guilt. You see, Paul was a guilty sinner. He was one who was guilty along with many others in, in stoning Stephen. And he, he was trying to stamp out Christianity. He even said of himself, I am the chief of sinners. But I want you to understand, he buried that guilt in the grave of God's forgetfulness. He became a great servant for God. Maybe there's some of us here today who, who have some things in our past. We've done some things that were terrible. Uh, maybe somebody knows them. Maybe doesn't, people don't know them, but we've done some things. But I want you to understand this morning, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness if we will confess that sin. And He is faithful and just to forgive us. But secondly, Paul had to forget past glory. Oh, how, how we are, especially if we are athletes, we love to tell the stories of our past accomplishments, and they get broader and broader the older we get. How many more points did I score? How many more bases did I steal? How many more runs did I score? All these things get more the older we get. 
But Paul was not only a great sinner, he was a great saint. He was one of the greatest Christians other than Jesus Christ who lived upon this earth. He was a great missionary. He was a great church planner. He was a great witness, a great servant. You may look at Paul and say, how can I ever measure up? Well, it's not about measuring up to somebody else. It's about measuring up to Jesus Christ. That's who we focus on. But Paul had to forget about all those glories in the past. He had to forget about past grief. Has someone ever hurt you? Has there been grief in your life? Paul suffered as few men ever suffered. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he said, The suffering is but a light affliction. How could someone who was shipwrecked and left for dead and stoned, all these things that happened to him, think of these sufferings and tribulations as just light afflictions? Because he was looking to God. He didn't dwell upon them and let that be the main source of his focus. You know, many people live a life of being a martyr. Oh, poor me, all this has happened to me. And, and they just go on and on. And that takes the focus upon the opportunity to serve Him today. Paul suffered so many things from his enemies. But let me tell you this, he also suffered from his friends and those in the church. And those are the hardest wounds to overcome. Those in the church that would hurt someone or say something and, 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 and stir up strife. Paul handled it well because he looked to Jesus And he didn't try to take matters into his own hands. He let the Lord handle those situations. He said in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, The suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He knew that God was taking care of all things. But fourthly, Paul had to forget past grudges. Anybody ever hurt you or say something about you? And you just hold on to that? Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's in the home. Maybe it's in church. You see, there were many people that did Paul wrong. Paul was abused. He was lied about. He was mistreated. He was cheated. He was overlooked. Everything you could think about happened to Paul. But he refused to feed a fever and nurse a grudge. There are too many people that are nursing a grudge today. They're losing the joy of serving the Lord today and enjoying their salvation all because they think by not talking to somebody else or being uh, bad to somebody else, it's going to get back at them. But the only person you're hurting is yourself. Because many times they don't even know the way you're acting. They don't know why you're doing that. They just go on about their business. But you're nursing a grudge. You and I must forget these things just as Paul did. But secondly, Paul not only had to forget the past, Paul had to fight the prospect. He had to worry about the future. He had, to, he had to not worry about tomorrow. He had to make sure that he didn't let tomorrow come into today. You see, one thing that can take the joy out of today is yesterday. Another is tomorrow. A psychologist by the name of William Martson surveyed 3,000 people and he asked them what they were living for. He found that 94% of the 3,000 that he surveyed were enduring today in order to get to tomorrow. Today was not the day that they were living for. They were only anticipating something happening tomorrow or something in their future. Uh, Life will get better tomorrow. And they were only looking toward tomorrow. The problem with that is that tomorrow may never come. Yes, looking forward to what's going to happen, we miss out living on today. Some people are waiting for tomorrow. Some people are worrying about tomorrow. But I want you to listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Jesus is saying, don't worry about tomorrow. I've got it taken care of today. Don't worry about tomorrow. That's not yours anyway. What happens when you worry? When you worry, you reach out into tomorrow And you take tomorrow's difficulties, tomorrow's concerns, tomorrow's things, and bring them into today. Today's already full. What you're doing is overloading today. Jesus said not to do it. Because Jesus said, I give you grace. Sufficient is my grace for every day. He didn't say about tomorrow. He said sufficient for each day. When you reach in tomorrow, when you bring in tomorrow's troubles, whether they're real, whether they're imaginary, 
You cram more into today than was meant to be crammed. You overload the circuit, so to speak. You upset God's divine plan for your life. Worry doesn't take the sorrow away from tomorrow. It takes the strength out of today. And then, after you've worried about tomorrow and tried to live today, you come to tomorrow, you meet tomorrow out of breath, with no strength and overloaded for that day. Worry does not make you ready for the future. It really makes you unready and takes away from the present. When we've been fighting tomorrow's battles today, we come to tomorrow out of breath. So we need to make sure we don't bring tomorrow into today. Worry clouds tomorrow's sunshine. I mean, today's sunshine. Tomorrow's clouds are going to take away from today's sunshine. So we see that time is a provided opportunity. Time is a present opportunity. And we need to realize that. Realize this, that yesterday is a canceled check. What do you do with a canceled check? Nothing. You forget about it. Tomorrow is just a promissory note. We don't know if we'll have tomorrow. Today is all the cash that you have to spend. So you need to spend it wisely. A wise man said this, Look well to this one day, for it and it alone is life. There is life in today. Yesterday is only a dream. Tomorrow is but a vision. Yet each day lived well makes yesterday a dream of happiness and tomorrow a vision of hope. Yesterday is a dream. Tomorrow is a vision. Life is today. So Paul says, redeem the time. Thirdly, he says there's the provided opportunity of time, the present opportunity of time, but thirdly, there's the precious opportunity of time. The precious opportunity of time. He says there in verse uh, 16, redeem the time. Redeem the opportunity. What do you do when you redeem something? You pay for it. You buy it back. That's what redemption is. There's something that you've been given, and so you wind up giving back your time to the Lord's glory. You redeem the time. You see, you need to see how valuable time is. To waste time is to waste your life because time is the stuff that life is made out of. And I say a lot of things about songs because I know songs titles and song lyrics and, and, and just not anything, all different types of genres. But Clint Black had a song on his very first album. And what was that song? Killing Time is Killing Me. The memory of his past love was killing him because he was sitting there killing time thinking about it. You see, a person who is killing time is not killing time. They are killing themselves. They're robbing themselves of the joy of living. Time is life. When I give you my time, when you give me your time, you're giving me a piece of your life. You're giving me something that is precious. Wisdom is the art of spending time wisely, redeeming it wisely. Paul said in, in Psalm, th chapter, uh, Psalm 90 verse 12, Teach us to number of days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Let me give you four principles of how that we need to f realize that time is precious and follow these principles. First of all, there is the prayer principle. You and I need to start every day out with prayer. That should be the first thing that we do. Thanking God and praying for the, the wisdom to live today. For the opportunities that sit before Him, we need to thank Him. But we need to ask Him as we greet the new day, we need to ask Him, what do you want me to do today? What is the most important that will bring you glory and honor? And don't say you don't have enough time to start the day with God. Because there's enough time in every day to do everything that God wants you to do. We need to slow down and start with Him. Start with Him and He will give us the opportunities and show us what's the most important, what we need to do today. It's an insult to God to say that you don't have enough time to do the things that He wants you to do. If you don't have enough time, then you're doing something God did not intend for you to do because He gives you all the time that you need to do what He wants you to do. So if you say, I don't have enough time to do that, you put something else in priority in front of God. And so He gives us enough time. Sometimes you, put, you do things that are imposed upon you by your, yourself or by other people. You know, as a pastor, I have to be careful to say, I can't say yes to everything and everybody. 
Sometimes I have to say, what's the most important thing I need to do? And I say no about some things. In order to keep uh, priorities in my life with my pastoral work and my other work and my, my family, I have to look at things. What's the most important that God says is important on the list? So we have the prayer principle. But secondly, there is the priority principle. After you pray, God speaks and He will. His will, it, it should become our will. When we pray, He speaks. And we listen, we obey. And so His will needs to become our priority. When our priorities come first, then everything in our life is out of order. When we only do what we want to do and what we think is most important and it's not God's will, then everything's out of order. You see, we have choices of good and evil. We have choices of obedience and disobedience every day of our life. And we need to find what God wants us to do. It's God saying, I want you to teach this class. I want you to serve in this capacity. I want you to do this. And you say, oh, I don't have time because of work. I don't have time because of my family. Then could it be you're putting your work or your family in front of God's will for your life? We have to ask those questions and seek God's wisdom. We need to desire to do what He wants and not our selfish desires. You know, Jesus was all about His Father's business. And in fact, He said, I have finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. He could not do that. He could not do the work and know what the work was unless he knew God's will for his life and made it a priority. What are the most important things in your life? What are the most important things in your day? Don't let the urgent things that come up from day to day uh, crowd out the most important things, and that's doing God's will. But fourth, thirdly, there is the promptness principle. How many of you are procrastinators? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because it's embarrassing. Because here's the reality. Procrastination is a sin. When you know to do something and you don't do it, the Bible says that is a sin. James 4 verse 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is a sin. Sin is not just merely doing wrong. It is failing to do things that can be right and should be done. Procrastination and disobedience to me are the same thing. You see, some people in church, uh, because they, they've been asked to do something or there's a ministry that needs to be done, they procrastinate on it. They keep putting it off and wanting to talk about it. But really what they're doing is being disobedient because they don't want to obey God. They don't want to do it. You and I need to cultivate a habit of instant obedience. And that takes willpower. And I heard a pastor describe willfare, uh, willpower with a definition such as this. When you have a job to do, begin this very hour. You supply the will, and God supplies the power. That's willpower. Then fourthly, there's the power principle. Verse 18 gives us the, the power here. In verse 18, it says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We don't need to live in the flesh. Fulfilling those desires and following our flesh and what our mind says. Don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit needs to lead us. And we need to be obedient. The power principle is to do God's will in the power of His Holy Spirit. Last point we want to make this morning is the passing opportunity of time. In verse 16. The days are evil. The days continue to pass on. I think it was Tracy Lawrence that had a song entitled, Time Marches On. And it just continued to march on. And you look at your calendar and, and you think, well, we just started 2018 and already here into 2019. We look at, it just seems to fly as we get older. But time is a passing opportunity. The days are evil. And because we live in a sin-cursed world, time is passing by. But you and I must give an account for this day. You and I must give an account of every day. Think of these things about time. You can't save it. You can't borrow time from somebody else. You can't loan it. You can't leave it. You can't take it with you. You can't give it to someone else in the sense of, I have so many years to leave, I'm going to give you some of my years. Can't do that. All you can do is use it or lose it. Time can't be stopped, first of all, in item A. Time can't be stopped. You know, in a football game, we have timeouts, don't we? And we go along, we're playing, all of a sudden there's timeout. And I'll tell you, I don't know why there's so many TV timeouts. 
when you go to a football game or you watch one on, on TV, it's just continually one time out after the other. But time can't be stopped like it is in a football game. Secondly, time can't be stored. You can't just store it up like you do money in the bank. You can't put your time in the bank and say, I'll use it when I want to. You have to use it now. And it can't be stretched. You can't add one more hair or year to your life, Jesus said. You know, you can't add another cup of water to the soup and make more soup. There's no way you can stretch time. Time can't be shared. Or, or time, it can't be shared, as I said a moment ago. It can't be shared in the sense that I can give you my books, I could give you my car, I could give you my money, I can give you these things, but I can't give you my time. My days are numbered. Your days are numbered. So God has them in His memory. Someone wrote these words. When as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, and time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I daily grew, time flew. Soon I shall find in traveling on that time is gone. That describes our life, doesn't it? When we're a kid, something will never get here. When we get to be a young man, it, it seems we don't have enough time to do things, and then it, it seems like it just flies by as we get older. And then when we come to the, our end of our life, we're going to realize that time is gone. It's a passing opportunity. And now the question is, what do you intend to do with the opportunity before you? Do you intend to be a soul winner this coming year? Then when? Start today. Do you intend to be a good steward of what God has given to you? When? Today. Do you intend to make reconciliation with an estranged family member? Say, so I would love to. Well, when? You need to resolve to do that today. Do you intend to call your mom? Is she still living? Do it today. Do you intend to talk to your dad or write him a letter and tell him how much you love him and thank God for what he did for you and, and how he was in your life and the sacrifices he made? Do it today. You see, the answer is when. And when answering the first part of that question, you should say, yes, I intend to do these things. And in answering the second part, you need to say, now. No time cannot be stopped. It cannot be stretched. It cannot be stored. It cannot be saved. It cannot be shared. But Paul does say something we can do. We are to redeem the time. We are to redeem the opportunity that is before us. As Donna and Mary come this morning, we're going to sing a song of invitation. I pray that this message has spoken to our hearts as we've looked at the greatest opportunity before us as we start this new year is the time that is given to us. Time to praise and worship Him and to glorify Him. Time to serve Him in areas of our life. and Time to minister to our church and our community and our families. Will you redeem the time? Do you have a decision that you need to make? If you would, stand and let's be obedient as we sing this song of invitation.